Hallelujah and blessings in Jesus, friends. Welcome back to Hayekadosh Ministries, where holiness is a way of life. Jesus is truly King of kings and Lord of lords, and the Holy Bible, praise God, is our only standard and authority for truth. And together, God's people say, Hallelujah. Well, friends, I trust this finds you feeling blessed in Jesus this morning. Today is December the 6th in the year of our Lord, 2017, and this is one a day for the soul. Now, we're continuing our journey through the Bible, through the story of the Bible, and as we have been center stage for the creation of all things, the wonder, the beauty, and the majesty, at this moment in our journey, a darkness enters into the garden of God where man has been placed as a ruler and given dominion over all of creation, the highest above all of creation. He is in perfect union and fellowship with God. And yet, somewhere in his time in the garden, a darkness appears. And that's what we're going to read about this morning. So if you have your Bibles, turn to Genesis chapter 3, and let's begin with these dreadful words. Now the serpent was more subtle, more crafty, more deceptive than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said. Now notice, the very question of doubt is presented in that question. Did God really say? Is that what he really meant? And isn't that what man has done up until this point? Twist the words of God to cater unto their own choices? And so the serpent, in his deceptiveness, has presented the question to Eve, Hath God said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Now, is that what God said? Of course not. God said you could partake of anything in the garden. Simply do not partake of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And so this is where the woman made a mistake because she enters into conversation with the serpent. You see, she should have gone no further. She should have put an end to it right there. She should have never entered into the discourse of conversation. And we can learn much from this story because if we would do the same, we would save ourselves from much failure. Think about it like an affair of sorts. A married man in his office receives a proposition from a woman. And rather than stopping that right there, he simply makes light of it. And that is the beginning of what leads to a marital affair. Whereas if he would have stood bold and put that woman in her place, informing her that he is a married man and he will not tolerate such behavior, an affair never would have incurred. And so something as simple as, well, hello, Mr. Jones, you look very sexy today. And a simple reply of thank you opens the door to a marital affair. I hope you can see what I'm saying. Whereas if he were to say after that statement, you are completely out of line, she would go no further in such statements most likely. And that's what Eve should have done. Eve should have put the serpent in his place rather than allowing the thought to go any further. So verse 2, the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, the tree of knowledge of good and evil, God has said, You shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. Now as far as we know, in the printed pages of Scripture, in the story that we have recorded for us, God never said you couldn't touch it. God simply said, you shall not partake of it. So she's added to the words of God. And what has God told us both in the first covenant, the Old Testament, and the second covenant, the New Testament? Simply not to add to or to take away from his words. For there's danger in doing so. Verse 4, the serpent said unto the woman, you will not surely die. For God knows that in the day you eat thereof, your eyes will be open and you shall be as God's knowing good and evil. Now, there's two things to point out here. First off, when God said you shall surely die, he, he's speaking of spiritual death. And the day they partake of this fruit of this tree, they will be spiritually dead. Their eyes will be open. They will become full of shame and guilt, which we'll see further in the story. 
But the second thing is the serpent says you will be as gods. And that pride of life, that desire to be something greater than a creature, greater than a worm of the earth, to exalt ourselves in our minds and think of ourselves so lofty, is the one thread that you see running through so many false religions. The same lie. If you do this, you can be as gods, more than a creature, because you will know good and evil. And at that moment, something triggered in the woman's mind. She saw that the tree was good for food, the lust of the eye. She saw that the tree was good for food, and it was pleasant to the eyes. And it was a tree to be desired to make one wise. There we see the lust of the flesh, the desire to be more. And so in this small story, we see what the disciple John tells us in 1 John, that there are three forms of sin. All sin will fall into one of these three categories, the lust of the eye, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. And even in the temptation of Jesus, we see that. When Satan tempted him to turn the rock into bread, the lust of the flesh, to feed his hunger. Bow before me and you will have all you see before you, the lust of the eye. Throw yourself down and prove yourself to be almighty, the pride of life. And so we see at the very first sin that was placed before men, we see the same three issues. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life. And so the woman took of the fruit thereof seeking to fulfill these lusts within her, and she ate, and she gave unto her husband. Now there are many speculations, and I reiterate, speculations that can be made at this point. First off, if Adam would have been with her and performing his husband duties, most likely he would have been there to guard her from such evil. The second speculation could be that because Adam loved her so much, he didn't want to see her punished alone, and so he partook of the fruit because of his love for the woman. The third, and a bit more on the comical side, would be that she nagged him so much, he finally gave in. And as we are told in 1 Timothy 2.14, we know that he was tempted by his wife, where she was tempted by the serpent. Now, another interesting thing just to point out here is notice that it's never called an apple. Where that came from, I'm not quite sure. We simply know it to be a fruit. And verse 7 tells us that in the moment that they partook of that fruit, the eyes of both of them were opened. As we remember in verse 5, they now know the difference between good and evil. They now understand shame and guilt. And they see themselves for the first time as naked and they go and sew fig leaves together and make themselves aprons. And isn't that so like men to try to cover their own tracks, cover their sin? And yet our covering is never good enough. God is going to have to supply the covering for sin. And we'll see that when God kills, he sacrifices one of his beautiful creation to create garments for them, the skins of animals. The life of another had to be given in order to cover man's sin. So we can see the story of Jesus represented here, and yet his final sacrifice is some 5,000 plus years away. Well, verse 8 tells us, They heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, as he was accustomed to do. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden, as if they could. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where are you? And God does this for an act of self-accountability. He's given Adam and Eve the opportunity to come forth in their shame, acknowledge their sin, and receive the love and forgiveness and the consequences of their actions from their Creator. But Adam doesn't do that. Adam says, I heard your voice in the garden and I was afraid. Well, of course you were afraid. He knows he disobeyed God. And he knows that there are consequences to his actions. He says, I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. I was ashamed to come before you. But notice God's response. He says, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree whereof I commanded you that you should not eat? And Adam, having already attempted to cover his own sin, 
still unwilling to accept responsibility for his own actions, begins the blame game. And he says, the woman who you gave to be with me, she gave me of the tree and I did eat. Now that's not a lie. That's a true statement. But even though Eve tempted Adam, he made the choice, the individual choice on his own to partake of the fruit. And it's so easy for us And we find ourselves often doing so, blaming others for our decisions. We might hear a spouse say, the reason that I cheated is because they didn't give me the time or the attention that I needed. No, the reason that you cheated is simply because you chose to cheat. And that's just one example, but I think the point is clear. We have to stop pointing the fingers at others for our mistakes, That is our natural and first tendency. But we need to look deep within ourselves and find out, discover what it is that caused us to make that poor decision because there's the problem. And if we work on ourselves and get those things figured out, like Jesus said, get the beam out of our own eye, then we will be able to see clearly to help others with the splinter that is in their eye. Our focus and our attention needs to be upon ourselves, not others. Absolutely honest with ourselves, transparent with ourselves. And this may be one of the most difficult things we ever do. Well, we're going to close there today, friends. And the next time we're together, we'll pick up in verse 13, where the Lord is going to begin to pass out sentencing to each of the parties involved for these acts of disobedience and rebellion. And so I think as we have seen this morning that there are many lessons that we can take from this story where we can learn from both the good and the bad. And by doing so, we will become more faithful followers of the Lord Jesus and more committed in our service unto him each and every day through each and every choice that we make. Well, I pray that your day to day will be blessed by the Lord Jesus, that you'll walk with a skip in your step and a smile upon your face. Now, as he wills, and until next time, friends, I truly love you. I'll see you on the next video.